Let's look at chapter two on linear functions. So we'll start by talking about linear and affine functions. Affine, as we'll see, is a slight extension of linear functions, which is also very useful, comes up in a lot of applications. Okay, so let's start with some notation. Uh, so it looks complicated, but this is uh, standard mathematical notation. Uh, this thing that says f colon, and then this bold r with a superscript n to r, what that says is that f is a function, and f takes as argument or an input or what it, what, it, what it takes in is an n vector. Uh, so that's what this rn means. And then what it does is it gives you back a real number. That's what this r over here means. So that's a, some people would call it scalar valued function, just a function. Lots of ways to think about functions, uh, ranging from informal to formal. Uh, informally, you can think of it as something like a process that takes uh, n numbers in, something happens, and it gives you a number back. You could think of it as a subroutine in a computer program. Or you could think of it as simply one, one real number, that's the output, um, which depends on n, n real numbers, and you can think of those as the input. And so we would write things like this, f of u. Um, here, u is a vector. So it's a vector, it's a list of n numbers. And then f of u, this whole thing here, is a number. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's, that's the notation. Okay. Now, a function from Rn to R, uh, that's how you pronounce this, um, satisfies what's called the superposition property, if the following holds. And these equations are things you have to look at, sort of, you have to look at them very carefully, very quietly, make sure you understand everything in them, because there's a lot of overloading going on. So they look completely reasonable. It says a juxtaposition of symbols, you read it and you're like, sure, why not? But you really have to kind of be very present and aware, uh, thinking about what all the parts mean. So let's take a look at it. Uh, superposition property says you start with a vector x and a vector y, and you start with uh, two scalars, alpha and beta, and then you form a linear combination. That's alpha x plus beta y. Then it says after you form a linear combination, evaluate, apply f, okay? And so you get f of alpha x plus beta y, and this whole left-hand side is a number. It's 3 minus 2.6. I don't know, okay? Now, let's look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side says we're actually going to do this in the reverse order. We're going to first apply the function to x, and we're also going to apply the function to y. Now, those two things are numbers, right? Because f takes as argument a vector, uh, x in this case, over here, and then it returns a number. So f of x is a number. So is f of y. And so over here, alpha, alpha next to f of x, which is a number, is just ordinary multiplication of two numbers. That's ordinary addition of two numbers. And the whole thing on the right is a number, and that's good because the left-hand side is a number, too. What superposition says is that actually you get the same thing if you form the linear combination basically before applying the function or after. And, and the way you might say that, in fact, the way a mathematician would say it is they'd say that, that the function f commutes with linear combinations. In other words, you can either do it before or after. The order doesn't matter. So that's a very special function, in, I mean, a very special property, and actually very few functions actually satisfy, you know, satisfy this exactly. But we'll see that a lot of, a lot of functions that occur in the wild uh, actually satisfy this either very closely or, uh, or quite well, approximately. Um, and we'll also see that a lot of uh, constructed functions, functions that will make up, actually do satisfy uh, linearity. Okay, so uh, if a function satisfies uh, superposition, the superposition property, which says that basically it commutes with forming linear combinations, then you call the function linear. And, and that's, that's very standard in, in mathematics. Uh, that's, in fact, it's a concept that goes throughout all of mathematics, applied mathematics, all of engineering, economic, I mean, just tons and tons of fields, statistics, a lot of stuff based on, on, on this idea. Okay, so now, right now, this is all very abstract, but hopefully soon this will be less abstract and therefore probably more interesting. Okay. So here's an example of a function that's linear, and it is the inner product function. So let's see what we, let's, let's be very careful about this. So we'll start with a, an n vector a, just a vector, um, but you have to specify it, okay? And then I'm going to form a function f of x. Oh, and by the way, how do, you, how do I, if I say I'm thinking of a function f and somebody says, what's your function? I have to explain what does f give for an arbitrary argument, right? And so here, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that when you give me x, f is going to calculate the inner product of a and x. And that just means f is going to calculate a weighted sum of the entries of x. 
Okay, and the weights, in fact, are the coefficients in the vector a here. So that's how that's going to work. Um, so that's the inner product function, it's very natural. And it turns out it's linear. So let's see why. Well, here, this we're going to form this linear combination here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply f. And by definition, to apply f means takes the inner, just, just says take the inner product with a. So that's that's the inner product of a and this vector. And we're going to use some properties of the inner product. Um, so for example, you can, if you have the inner product of a vector with the sum of two other vectors, it's the same as the inner product of the first one with the first, the vector with the first one, and the, plus the vector with the second one. So that's this second line here. That tells us that we can write it this way over here. Um, okay, and then we're gonna use another property of the inner product, and that is that scaling a vector, which is an argument in a linear, in an inner product, is the same as scaling the inner product. And so what that means is that the alpha and the beta can go outside. Uh, notice something interesting here, right? Inside here, alpha x is scalar vector multiplication. In the next line, alpha times, that's a number. So that's actually, in the next line, alpha is actually engaged only in number number or scalar multiplication, okay? And then we recognize uh, inner product of a with x and inner product of a with y. Those are nothing but f of x and f of y, so we get this. And sure enough, this says that f of alpha x plus beta y is alpha f of x, plus beta f of y. And that holds for any x and y, any alpha and beta, right? So that means it's linear. So, okay, so that, so, we, there, so there are linear functions. Uh, any inner product function is a linear function. Now, it turns out, in fact, it's more. Uh, in fact, that's all the linear functions there are. So another way to say it is this. Suppose I tell you simply that a function is linear. You know absolutely nothing more about it. Then it turns out we can actually write it as the inner product of x with a vector a uh, for an a. And we're going to be very specific about what a is. Um, ai is simply f of ei. And remember that ei is the ith unit vector. And it looks like this, right? It's got, you know, well, it didn't come out well but drawing. But the idea is uh, it's it should be uh, a vector with all entries 0 and 1, 1 in the ith position. And that's it, OK? So it says. AI is you apply F to that vector, you get a number, that's AI. Okay, and let's see why. Well, uh, F of X is, now here we're, we're doing this kind of very silly expansion. We're saying that X is equal to X1, that's its first component times E1, plus X2 times E2 plus X3 and so on. Now, that's expressing X as a linear combination. Now, this thing, you can apply the superposition rule recursively, and you'll find that F of a linear, of a, of a, of a linear combination is the linear combination of f applied to each of the vectors. And so that's the equation down below. And this thing, we see, that is exactly the inner product of a and x, uh, where a is, give, is the vector whose entries are f of ei. So we see that. OK. So, um, oh, by the way, this is called the, the inner product representation of a function. I mean, of a linear function, sorry. It, I mean, it's a bit silly, but it says that any, any linear function has an inner product representation. OK. So, so. Okay, it's just a fancy name for inner products. Okay, we're also going to encounter something called affine functions. Uh, now, a function that's, uh, if it's linear plus a constant, um, it's called affine. Um, oh, let me point something out about a linear function. If f is linear, we know now that it has to have the form, inner, it's an inner product, looks like that. And we can immediately calculate that f of 0 is 0. Actually, we didn't even need that form. We, knew, we know that if it's linear, well, it, this follows immediately from linearity, is that a function has to map 0 to 0. Oh, and just heads up, that 0 is a vector. This 0 is a number, right? That's the number 0. That's the vector 0, right? So and we don't distinguish them. After a while, I'm going to stop pointing these things out, and it's going to be on you to keep track of you know, what the notation means and things like that, and, and especially to disambiguate the overloadings, right? So overloading is when you use the same symbol to mean different things depending on the context. So this is a perfect example. After a while, you get used to it. I won't mention it anymore. Maybe every, every now and then I will just for fun. But the point is, this is, some, this is a very important thing to get used to, is you can write stuff down super easily, looks good, but you have to actually just always, always make sure you understand exactly what the notation means. Okay, so um, an affine function is a linear function plus a constant, okay? And in this case, if it's affine, then f of 0 is actually b. And b is a number. Um, and in fact, some people call b 
the offset, right? Or the that, that that's a that's one of the names for it. It's an offset in the affine function. Um, okay. Now it turns out an affine function is also characterized by a superposition type uh, a, a superposition type equation. And let me say let me show you what that is. Um, it's this. It says you form a linear combination of x and y. That's alpha x plus beta y. And I apply f to it. And it says I get the same thing as this. Now, by the way, if f is if f is linear, this identity here holds for all x and y, all alpha and beta. That's linear. Okay, maybe it's superposition. Okay. Now, if f is affine, this formula holds uh, whenever. Uh, it holds, but for a restricted set of alpha and beta, they have to add up to 1, alpha and beta, right? So um, they, they could be 0.3 and 0.7, uh, minus 0.3 and 1.3, something like that. These are, these are uh, pairs. And if for all such combinations you satisfy superposition, then f is affine, right? So that's how that works. Okay. Now, um, oh, and I should say something. Um, sometimes when you have a linear combination where the coefficients add to 1, some people refer to that as a mixture. Uh, it's a special kind of linear combination, but people call it a mixture because you think of it as 30% of this, 70% of that. Now, a mixture allows you to have negative weights, but that's okay as long as they add up to one. Okay. Um, one, thing to, to, uh, one thing to know about affine functions is that a lot of people actually call them, uh, call them linear. Um, and, you know, maybe that comes from high school or something, and I'll, I'll explain that in, in a minute. Um, but affine functions generally are not linear. Um, so, so here's a quick example. In this one, uh, n is one, so uh, x is a one vector, otherwise known as just a number. So here's here's x along this axis, and I can plot x. That's this blue line here. Um, now on the left, f is linear, and the slope, by the way, here is exactly a. So a in this case is a one vector, otherwise known as a number, and so a might be I don't know if this were drawn to scale, might be I don't know, let's say. A third or something like that, one third, point three. There, that's what that's what that's what a is for this picture. Point two, I don't know. Um, point five, sorry. Um, okay, so this is what, and notice that it you know goes through zero, and it's a straight line. And in fact, the way we get the name linear uh, is because the graph is a line. It's a line, so it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, or at least I believe that to be the etymology of of linear function. But okay. On the right, over here, we see a function that's affine. It is not linear. It's for sure not linear because a linear function goes through zero. And g of zero is here. And it is very much, in fact, this is b. Um, if this, if g of x is a, uh, you know, I'm going to write it as an inner product, even though the inner product of two numbers is silly. It's just the product. But I'll write it that way just to remind you. And so this is b here. And then the slope here is, you know, minus one quarter or something like that. A is minus a quarter. So that's an affine function. And I think even in high school, people talk about, I think, I, here's, here's what I remember. Maybe your notation was different. But I remember people saying, like, it was something like this, as I recall. Uh, don't quote me on this. Uh, but, and that was the equation of a line, something like that. You know, M is the slope and B. And you can see it's just an affine function. But I guess... They don't tell high school students that's an affine function. Anyway, it's affine. So, oh, um, so anyway, you will not, you you will find lots of situations where people refer to affine functions as linear. And it's cool. But if you're around like weird, picky mathematicians, if you don't know them that well, you're probably better off referring to affine functions correctly as affine. So, but if you're with friends and everybody knows all this, then, you know, you can call them linear if you like.